Welcome to the second part of this symposium in honor of Dimitrios Trikopoulos. In the first part, we made the tour through the scientific accomplishments of Dimitrios. This second part will focus on Dimitrios as a mentor. In his own words, Dimitrios was taking up unusual ideas. And while his friends and colleagues would attribute this to his original thinking, he would be quick to counter-argue that it was merely a reflection of constraints in Greece. Poverty generates ingenuity, he used to say. And it was uh, this scientific curiosity and love for intelligent ideas that he would try to encourage with his students. He also wanted to make sure that they realized there is little variation in intellectual capacity. And what makes the difference between success and failure is in science is hard work, perseverance, and the ability to stand up after you have fallen. And his most favorite example about this was the example of one of his most quoted papers, the paper on passive smoking and lung cancer. As you heard from uh, Paolo Bofetta, this paper was published in the International Journal of Cancer in 1981. But what you probably do not know is that before that, it was submitted to the New England Journal of Medicine. <laughs> it was sent out to reviewers. The authors accommodated the concerns of the reviewers. But the journal eventually decided not to publish the paper. And here is their reply letter in which they mention that they realize that the implications of the findings are enormous. They believe that the authors will be proven right. They will understand if the authors tell them that they are chicken. <laughs> but they were reluctant to publish the study. Yet, the study got published, and Dimitrios got recognition for his work on passive smoking and lung cancer. You've heard about this interview several times today. It was an interview Dimitrios gave to Michel for the Voices section of epidemiology. And when asked by Michel what is the single most important advice that he would give a new epidemiologist starting their career, Dimitrios said, quote, believe in the work you're doing, be ready for successes, and more so for failures. Failures are bound to exist. It's a rule of life. The only way to avoid failure is to not do anything, and this is not an acceptable alternative. And there is something else. You heard this before, but I think it's worth hearing it again. In science, we need to be kind. Disagreement in science requires scientific arguments and not personal hostility and rudeness. Today, we will hear from five students, later colleagues, of Dimitrios, who worked very closely with him. The order in which they're going to present is not random. It's actually the order in which they studied together with Dimitrios. <laughs> Dimitrios had a very effective system of choosing his doctoral students. Everyone picked her successor. And by Dimitrios' request, they had to make sure their successor knew his strengths, but most importantly, his limitations as a mentor. And the system proved to be very effective. The gentleman at the end of the panel was not a doctoral <laughs> student of Dimitrios. <laughs> but we could not ever in this school have a panel on mentoring without Frank Cook. OK. And with this, I would like to ask Lauren Lipworth to come to the panel. Lauren is associate professor in the Division of, Epidemi of Epidemiology at the Department of Medicine in Vanderbilt University. And she will talk to us about the obesity biomarker axis and breast cancer risk in black and white women, making a full circle back to Dimitrios Trikopoulos. Thank you, Michelle and Pagona and Antonia for inviting me here today. As sad as I feel to be on this campus for the first time without Demetrius, it is a great honor for me to stand here to honor him as a teacher, a mentor, and a colleague. 
Demetrius was the most inspiring teacher I have ever had, and he is the reason that I became an epidemiologist and the reason that I decided to study here at the Harvard School of Public Health. I was a young college graduate, not really sure about what I wanted to do with my career. I was working in a lab at Rockefeller University and had decided I didn't want to work with rats and I didn't want to be a clinical physician, and so I had asked for some advice from Dr. Zena Stein, who was an old friend of my grandmother's and an epidemiologist at Columbia University, and she said, you know, you might be interested in this field. It's science and math and statistics and all the things that you really like, and so I began my tour of schools of public health, and I came uh, here and met with Demetrius. That was my first visit. And I left here, and I'll never forget, on the train on the way home, I called my parents and I said, I want to be an epidemiologist and I want to work with Demetrius. So I am very grateful that I had the opportunity to do so. Um, I'm currently working at Vanderbilt University at the, um, in the Department of Medicine and the Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center. And as I was thinking about my talk today, I was thinking how interesting it is that although my research paths have kind of gone in some different directions over the past 20 years, the two main projects that I'm working on right now are actually literally coming full circle back to Demetrius. So I'm going to talk very briefly about those and about him. Uh-oh. So as we've heard this morning, my, uh, the, the, fir the initial um, opportunities that I had to work with Demetrius were here at Harvard. Um, we conducted a study looking at cord blood and maternal blood hormone levels um, in, re in uh, Chinese women and a cohort of women here in Boston. And as Pagona uh, presented this morning, some of the notable findings were that cord blood IGF-1 were, levels were higher in Caucasian than in Chinese women. And IGF-1 was significantly positively associated with birth weight and birth length among Caucasian women. So this uh, really led to the understanding that IGF-1 may be an important dominating factor in fetal growth. It, as Chung showed later um, this, earlier this morning, it correlates with stem cell potential and it's concordant with the role in breast cancer risk. So these studies uh, dated back as early as 1999. I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to publish one last paper with Demetrius in 2013, about a year before he passed away. Um, and as we heard again this morning, he published back in the late 1960s an association between height and breast cancer. And in 2013, a paper was published in JNCI which was um, entitled Height as an Important Explanatory Factor for Excess Cancer Risk in Men Compared to Women. And in that study, Walter and colleagues wrote, it is early exposure that influences both height and risk of cancers in adulthood, and childhood IGF-1 levels may be implicated. So the day that paper came out, Demetrius called me with Pagona and said, we, we need to write a letter, we need, to, we need to expand on this, we need to tell them that we agree, and we had hypothesized this you know, many, many years ago. He said, so why don't you draft a letter, and we'll talk again later this week. And in pure Demetrius form, about two hours later, he called me and he said, I already drafted the letter. <laughs> it's, it, here, I'm going to send it to you right now. <laughs> so. Um, we did publish that letter to the editor, and um, in that letter we pointed out that we had earlier indicated that the intrauterine period would be, a cr would, would be a critical period, and that both cord blood IGF-1 and stem cell potential are correlated with birth weight, which in turn predicts both adult height and overall adult cancer risk. So that brings me to some work that I'm doing um, right now at Vanderbilt. This is a project that we're doing within the breast cancer spore. Um, which is, for those of you who don't know, it's a specialized project of research excellence and comprises four projects, one of which is a population-based um, study. And for this, I am indebted to my colleague and successor as Demetrius's doctoral student, Lisa Signorello, who was the founding PI of the cohort and unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, as most of you probably know, obesity is generally associated with increased can breast cancer risk among postmenopausal women. However, the association um, seems to vary somewhat by cancer subtype, breast cancer subtype, and by race. And it is generally believed that the most important mechanisms underlying an association between obesity and breast cancer include insulin signaling and resistance, increased estrogen biosynthesis, and inflammation. However, the relative contributions of each of these pathways to increase breast cancer risk may differ between black and white women, 
which may contribute to observed racial differences in breast cancer risk by subtype. And this study draws from some preliminary findings that we have within the uh, Southern Community Cohort Study, suggesting that obesity and its association with particular biomarkers differs by race. And so we have set out um, to examine whether circulating levels of obesity-related biomarkers, including IGF-1, a number of inflammatory cytokines, and steroid sex hormones, are associated with risk of postmenopausal breast cancer by race and or tumor subtype. And so just for, for those who don't know, the Southern Community Cohort Study is a large cohort study of about 86,000 black and white adults in, the 12, in 12 southeastern United States. Um, the cohort is unique in that it generally represents a low-income portion of the population that has not generally been studied in previous um, epidemiologic investigations. Um, and so the cohort is being followed um, actively and passively, and so we've been able to ascertain breast cancer incidence in the cohort. We currently have about 650 cases. So this is all very preliminary data, but one of the things that we have shown um, in, our, in our breast cancer cases is what has been observed in other cohorts, but a very strong difference in the subtype distribution of breast cancer comparing black women to white women. And so generally speaking, you can see that white women are more likely to have estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, whereas black women are more likely to have estrogen receptor negative breast cancer. And um, of particular interest for our study, black women are significantly more likely to have what's called triple negative breast cancer, so ER, PR, and HER2 negative breast cancer. And um, we're planning to actually subtype these tumors um, using molecular subtyping, but for now we've just got our data on hormone receptor status. Um, so underlying this association, there have been many studies published in our group and others and the AMBER consortium showing that some of the kind of established reproductive and other risk factors for breast cancer may operate differently for estrogen receptor positive versus estrogen receptor negative. And in our study, we have actually found a strong positive association between increasing parity and estrogen receptor negative breast cancer, which is contrary to the generally accepted protective effect of parity for estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. And I'm going to show these data more just for the example of following in, the, in Demetrius' footsteps as opposed to the data themselves because these are very preliminary. This is crude data um, only on our first about 200 cases and 400 controls. But one of the uh, biomarkers that we're looking at is IGF-1. And you can see here that there is a tendency for black women to have higher levels of IGF-1 compared to white women. Um, and these are all taken in pre-diagnostic samples at the time of cohort enrollment, so prior to breast cancer. Um, and we also find a tendency towards lower levels of IGF-1 in estrogen receptor negative compared to estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. And again, these are crude numbers. We need to do a lot of work statistically and otherwise to look at what, how much of these differences may be accounted for by obesity and other differences between the groups. The other project or um, initiative that we're currently working on, which um, really does come full circle back to Demetrius, is that we are in the process of developing methods for accelerating lifespan-oriented research at Vanderbilt. Um, and the goal here is really to use the electronic health record um, and linked biospecimen repository to study this. So Vanderbilt has what we call the synthetic derivative, which is a de-identified and continuously updated version of the electronic health record. It contains uh, de-identified records for over two million people, and it, is, um, it was established for research purposes. That is linked to what we call BioView, which is a, um, a DNA biobank of about 200,000 individuals. And we also have plasma and umbilical cord blood collection um, underway as pilot studies. So that, together with um, natural language processing and algorithm development expertise, has led us to be able to identify over 100 phenotypes within the electronic health record, which can then be used um, either on their own or linked with the biospecimens. And one of the things that we're doing now, which is really um, 
tied uh, intricately to Demetrius's work, and I think it's kind of interesting because Pagona this morning presented her boxes, and there was this blank box in the middle, which kind of came between the early life exposures and the mammographic density, and that's a time period that we actually think that we can address, you know, sort of intermediate markers of disease or intermediate phenotypes that lead to increased risk for disease using this approach as it's unlikely that we'll be able to use this electronic medical record for very long-term outcomes such as cancer. So what we're doing right now is we are linking the mother and child records through this de-identified bio, um, through this de-identified biobank so that we're going to have these dyads which will be linked mother-child records <coughs> and will allow us to examine associations between maternal phenotypes, infant birth characteristics, and infant growth during the postnatal and early life period. We are also um, intending to collect umbilical cord blood and possibly placental tissue, which will allow us to examine cord blood biomarker associations with um, phenotypes of metabolic dysfunction or adiposity, including blood pressure or lipid profiles during childhood and adolescence, as well as with biomarkers um, related possibly to obesity, such as inflammatory cytokines or sex steroid hormones during childhood and adolescence. Um, a very large proportion of the babies born at Vanderbilt are actually followed through the Vanderbilt Health System and the pediatric, um, the pediatric system at Vanderbilt well into their adolescence, so it gives us a great opportunity to study this um, as kind of lifespan research. And finally, having the linked DNA biobank will give us the opportunity to examine associations between either maternal or fetal genetic variation, for instance, um, maternal variation in inflammatory genes and cord blood epigenetic changes, coupled with maternal lifestyle characteristics and other maternal phenotypes and infant and early life phenotypes and health tra trajectories. So I'll just quickly acknowledge my funding sources for these studies which I've presented today. And I do want to end really quickly. I know I only have two minutes. Um, this is Demetrius with my youngest son, who is now 11. And we visited him about two summers ago, I think, on our way up to Martha's Vineyard. And we came and had lunch. And I've always made a point of telling my children so much about him. And I know we've heard a lot today about his greatness as an epidemiologist and, and a scientist and a mentor. But I think that there's really so much more that makes him a giant. And the, um, I'm going to leave it to Lisa to talk specifically about his mentoring. But for me, I think the things that really stand out about Demetrius are that he was so incredibly generous with his time and knowledge. His office door was always open. I don't think I actually had an office here at the School of Public Health besides my desk in his office. I probably spent 12 hours a day in there learning from him, learning with him, writing with him, reading. Um, and so really, it's hard to imagine that he could have been so senior chair of the department and been so generous with his time for all of us. Um, and the other thing is that he has really instilled in me a work ethic and humility that has permeated my life, and I don't think that anybody else has had as much influence on me in terms of um, those particular characteristics than Demetrius. So I will uh, always remember that love in his eyes that you can see here in this picture. Thank you.